Perfect. I'm recording right now. Uh, by the way, welcome around for joining us today. I'll go through the reading of the policy as usual, that I used to do. Uh, Linux Foundation meetings involve participation by industry competitors, and it is the intention of the Linux Foundation to conduct all of its activities in accordance with applicable antitrust and competition laws. It is therefore extremely important that attendees adhere to meeting agendas and be aware of and not participate in any activities that are prohibited under applicable US state, federal, or foreign antitrust and competition laws. Examples of types of actions that are prohibited at Linux Foundation meetings and in connection with the Linux Foundation activities are described in the Linux Foundation Antitrust Policy. If you have a question about, about these matters, please contact your company counsel, or if you're a member of the Linux Foundation, feel free to contact Andrea Up the Grove of the firm of Gasmer Up the Grove LLP, which provides legal counsel to the Linux Foundation. Hyperledger is committed to creating a safe and welcoming community for all. More information, please visit our Hyperledger Code of Conduct. Perfect. By the way, again, Laurent, welcome to this small community. Glad to have you here today. I'm delighted to hear from you. And I will handle the speech to you. And please step in and take the word. So it's time to speak. All right. Very good. Can, can you guys hear me OK? Can you? Sorry. Can you, can you, can you guys hear me fine? Yeah, 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 yeah. We can okay, hear beautiful. you. Uh, OK, very good. So good, good morning and, and good afternoon uh, to everyone. And um, well, thank you, Andrea, for you know, organizing this session. And I'm glad. Um, you know, and, and I'm going to try in the next hour to make this uh, to make this session as interesting um, as I can. Actually, that's uh, the second time um, that I have an opportunity in the past year, I think, to talk to um, uh, the Hyperledger uh, Special Interest Group. Uh, the first time was not in trade finance. Uh, it was in supply chain, but in some way, I'm sure many of you will see uh, some similarities in, in this process. And um, what I try to prepare, um, so that's the antitrust uh, overview that Andrea just went through. Um, what I try to prepare today and, and share uh, is basically a mix of, um, I think, what's happening in the market from, from our standpoint at, at ChainStack and also what, what we've seen uh, happening together with customer and partners. And also a view of the ecosystem and basically the solutions and, and challenges around uh, trade finance use cases uh, that we've seen. So, you know, again, my presentation is probably around, um, as I mentioned to Andrea, about 30 to 35 minutes, maybe slightly longer, slightly shorter, uh, but I'm happy to uh, be interrupted. Uh, if you guys have any question, um, there are really three parts uh, to this presentation. Uh, some statement and some view of the market from my standpoint, and, and then um, some of the challenges that we see in the construction of consortium within the trade finance area, which I think is, is a fascinating topic, if, if you would ask me, uh, because I think it's going to create amazing opportunity for some of you on this call and some of the companies involved with uh, the Hyperledger ecosystem and other ecosystems in the blockchain industry to basically create uh, new processes, automate these processes in some different ways. And that's what trade finance is all about. So I'm, I'm really glad I'm given the opportunity to, uh, to, talk, to, to, to talk to you today. Um, let me make uh, a short make, introduction uh, of myself. Let me make a short introduction of myself. Um, so I'm, I'm a French uh, citizen, but I've been living outside of uh, France for about 25 years. I spend most of my time uh, in between the West Coast and East Coast of the US for about uh, 11 or, or 12 years. And the rest of the time I, I actually spent in Asia in a beautiful place called, called Singapore. And um, as many of you, I'm sure on this call, I, I don't necessarily come from uh, the crypto world. Um, I was not a, a miner. I was not a, a Bitcoin uh, crazy guy. I was a very traditional um, software platform 
uh, builder and most of my experience is really in brick and mortar uh, technology companies such as Microsoft and Parallels and, and Acronis. And as part of this, you know, I think I had the opportunity to, to talk to and understand many different businesses, which actually led me back in 2016, 2017 to be more curious and more interested about how blockchain technology and decentralized ledger technology could potentially help addressing some of the challenges I was noticing or, or trying to solve within the enterprise space, mostly in terms of automation, uh, tracking, uh, but also um, um, uh, basically combining efforts and, uh, and making sure that people could collaborate better because blockchain is all about uh, network effect and it's all about collaboration. And that's the first thing that struck me back in 2016. And since then, you know, I've been trying both in the public blockchain space and the private blockchain space uh, to make sure we could facilitate uh, some of the, um, um, you know, uh, 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 problems uh, solving that, that we manage and, and use technology to basically um, help these um, uh, companies to do better. Um, let me start um, by a quick introduction on, on, on trade finance, right? Uh, trade finance is um, a very, very significant and important uh, part of the global um, industry and it has many criteria which are really interesting. Um, there is a, a fairly high fragmentation to start with and opacity in some way, and also a lot of reliance on, on manual processes, uh, paper processes, which are basically driving the demand for applications that can operate uh, from a single source of truth. And, and that's why since early 2016, you've seen many blockchain use cases, many consulting companies, many uh, project and software companies trying to address uh, the trade finance issue. Here, where we are based in Asia, uh, trade finance is even um, more of a challenge because of the fragmentation of the market, right? In Asia alone, we have 11 uh, different markets with different languages, different processes, different currency, creating amazing opportunity to basically optimize uh, some of those processes. Now, if you think of uh, trade finance from sourcing to manufacturing to financing to distribution, and basically the seamless exchange of data and value uh, being possible throughout all actors in the supply chain, then you're looking at a major uh, optimization opportunity across the board. You're talking of you know, a few percentage points of margins that you can save and intermediary that you can basically manage better or reduce and providing um, a better solution altogether. In fact, I think um, um, that Gardner, I, I took some notes uh, because I, I, I had to search for this, but I think Gardner back at the end of 2020 um, mentioned that much of the wholesale uh, trade growth actually for 2020 and, and later would come from the use of cases in trade finance where automation of the process can create significant and uh, significant efficiency across all parties. And, and that's what basically trade finance is all about. And I'm gonna go through you know, some of those use cases um, that, that we see, but it's all about significant efficiency in automating processes and, and across multiple parties, which is very difficult to, to do today in a more traditional uh, setup. So the digital transformation uh, process that has started is fascinating by itself. I think you you hear every day, and I have many examples in my presentation about um, entities, consortiums, banks. You know, some of you with your company, I'm sure, on, on this call, have a similar ambition to basically help um, uh, accelerating this digital transformation process and make sure that trade and supply chain will be better documented or well documented and that distribution, distributed application and network will bring together a disparate and very diverse uh, number of parties that are involved through trade finance. Right. So I think at this stage, I, I'd like to 
not really give um, uh, an example of uh, of what uh, trade finance or an exhaustive view of what trade finance, because I'm sure you guys are well aware of this. But I wanted to share a little bit more about what we have seen and also what we have touched um, in chain stack in the past uh, year, uh, 12 months, 18 months. And they are basically organized around uh, four different type of use cases, right? Uh, one, one case um, which we see more and more recently is basically to build a more efficient capital market process, right? And here you see such use cases as digital collateral and, and compliance uh, use cases. You also see optimizing uh, OTC derivatives and post-trade processing. Right. And I think these use cases, you know, for a few years, you, you've seen a few. And what's interesting here is you see an acceleration of many banks, especially in Asia, um, that are interested in improving uh, both uh, digital collateralization and, and the compliance aspect. Now, a second type of use case we see is basically building uh, digitally native trade and supply chain processes. And, and that's the most common, I think, that has existed in most of the consortium and most of the uh, uh, trade finance uh, use cases that we've been involved with for probably four years, even five years, right? It's starting back in 2018, 2019, uh, it was um, already fairly developed. And here you're looking at two uh, separate track. I think one track is really on traceability and trusted data across the supply chain, which I think is what has progressed the faster, um, simply because tracking um, and, and uh, creating uh, audit trail and trusted a certain level of trust within uh, the supply chain is, is probably a, a very natural uh, criteria uh, for blockchain to be based on and, and it works very well. The second use case is trade-based money laundering. And we've seen some use cases here in Asia, I think in the Philippines, you've seen some um, uh, uh, ideas around this. Some of the um, uh, central bank have, have thought about this as well. It's not as developed, but we see this happening. Then of course, the third use case, um, which will be a, a very a big one together with, uh, with the last one, is basically building a next generation post-trade uh, solution. I, I think this will only come into play later after you basically build a, a digitally native trade and supply chain process that works and, and that is already relatively automated. And then the last use case that we've seen is really around building next generation payment infrastructure, which I think is a, um, you know, a beast by itself uh, because it will require um, uh, distributed infrastructure for real-time and faster payment, but also building a modern and real-time payment platform, uh, which I'm sure will take um, uh, quite some years to achieve. But altogether, these four use cases, uh, I think, have gained a lot of merit um, in many ways, and, and you see them happening in many places uh, across um, uh, Asia, certainly we, we see it happening um, in the US in, in specific conditions. And uh, we also see it happening uh, over Europe um, in, uh, in Western Europe uh, countries, even though it's, it seems to be a little bit slower than what we see in Asia. Now, so that's trade finance. And I'm sure you guys can come up with um, multiple other examples of, of project uh, that you might have been involved with or that production that have gone live uh, in, the past, uh, in the past years, but that, that's what we have seen as far as Chainstack is concerned. Now, the reason I wanted to set the stage is because every single one of those four different um, examples are basically conditioned by a very active and very digital and more automated collaboration. And collaboration is imperative in trade finance. Um, and I'm sure all of you have noticed, if not experienced firsthand, that this is a very complicated process to make all these different players of the trade finance area work together. Now, what blockchain brings and what decentralized solution brings is basically a certain level of collaboration based on trust, right? And I'm not gonna give you a one-on-one uh, 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 
class on how blockchain create trust. But I think it's important to make people remember that there is um, uh, an interesting aspect in the technology itself, which is that it creates immutability and 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 certain level of auditing, which makes collaboration easier. And the reason I stress this is because it seems that especially in trade finance, trust is one of the main inhibitor across the board in order to accelerate the process of transforming trade finance. And this trust is basically between different parties sharing documents or sharing uh, data or sharing information that needs to be um, uh, basically verified and, and better um, uh, uh, authenticated in some way or, or tracked so that it can actually be used across the board on more platforms. And I think that's important. And the reason I mentioned this is because true collaboration does not always happen. Now, one point um, that we noticed, um, which I think is interesting, is the fact that um, collaboration in trade finance already exists, right? I mean, one could argue that trade finance by itself is already a big supply chain and full chain of uh, successive collaboration working together, most of them one-to-one -one or some one-to-many, and that basically allow people to create certain level of efficiency. However, and, and that's probably why, by the way, trade finance was one of the first things that people thought blockchain could help. Now, however, you still have huge inefficiencies because most of those trade finances starting uh, the use cases that I mentioned um, are basically managed in silo, right? Data are basically in silo. What you're going to see across companies and the way they share this information or the way information is being shared across multiple parties is still very much organized in a central and, and difficult way for people to collaborate more freely. And that creates basically a situation where you have layers of intermediaries that add some limited values, right? And of course, you know, it's kind of easy to say intermediaries create limited values. When you talk to the people today in the chain of say a trade finance documentation altogether, you know, every probably single chain of this big chain creates some level of value, but the value they add also create inefficiencies and, and, and potential optimization, which I think is why blockchain can truly make trade finance look better than this picture, right? I mean, this picture is probably a good example on how people discuss, argue, and come together. Now, the reason I chose this picture here is because I'd like to explain that for people to collaborate, it's not only uh, a technology agreement, it's also a scope, it's also a governance, it's also a way to work together. And frequently, especially in the early trade finance use cases that we've been involved, it looks like people had not really think about how this could be scaled and strive as network, creating network effect, which I think in trade finance will be amazingly powerful. So blockchain is offering partially a solution to trust and to basically improve collaboration all together by providing certain level of verification, traceability, maintain privacy, and remove intermediary. So all the bugs are checked when it comes to trade finance. And in fact, this is probably why you've seen so many trade finance consortium um, uh, developing uh, in the past five or six years, right? I mean, you have, you know, some familiar name here. I'm sure more, most of you know Tradelands. I'm sure most of you know WeTrade. I'm sure you know, and you are also familiar with some of the R3 uh, consortium uh, in trade finance, which are also based in Asia, like Contour and Marco Polo. Now, if you look at this ecosystem, which I think is a good view of the ecosystem, even though this is dated 2019, so the ecosystem has changed a little bit, but I did not find a better representation of it. What you can notice already is that several of those consortiums here are basically trying to address the same issue, 
right? Either in the way um, uh, trade is organized around shipping or freight, right? Or in the way documentation of letter of credits, bill of lading, et cetera, are being passed down through um, uh, different players or how commodities are being traded, or you know, how uh, KYC can actually be organized. And many of those consortium, if you look at the detail of the different use cases they're trying to address, right? Each of them are probably addressing three to four, right? Depending on, on their level of maturity, anywhere from documentation to invoicing to better collaboration. Basically, those consortiums, they also compete together. And another thing which is kind of interesting in the construction of these consortiums is many uh, players are actually part of multiple consortiums, right? A little bit like an enterprise would basically open multiple bank, ac bank accounts uh, to mitigate each risk, right? So that's kind of the landscape. And I was, um, I think, involved um, in uh, many discussion with um, at least six of, of those, uh, five, I'm sorry, of those uh, different protocols. And I was very bullish back in 2018, 2019, that they would basically grow and organize themselves very fast. Well, in fact, depending on whether you look at, you know, your glass uh, being half full or half empty, one could argue that the formation of this consortium was very fast. Another one could argue that uh, the scale and the number of partners uh, involved uh, and participant involved with this consortium has not grow as exponentially as what uh, some people thought. And I think the reason for this is mostly uh, linked to the challenges of creating a consortium. And, and I don't think those are naturally trade finance related consortium issues. I think those are issues linked with consortium, but what's special in trade finance, I think, is that you have a mix of different industries that are supposed to collaborate together in anywhere from shippers to builders, to manufacturing, to banking. And this creates basically different industries process ecosystem and for them to work together. And we see, and at least that's what we experimented, uh, four type of issue in the way um, um, those consortium basically aggregates. And what I'd like to do in this you know, third part of my presentation is basically go through some of those detail uh, issues we, we saw some of our customer and some of uh, people we work with facing so that you can maybe avoid them or, or um, uh, basically build a solution for. So the first issue we see in the construction um, and establishing a decentralized consortium is really the scope of the consortium itself. And I think this is somewhat linked to uh, governance in some way, and I'll come back to this. But the first thing that we see is basically the scope of what the consortium is supposed to build and deliver, right? Initially, most of the consortium were built across a very large mandate of basically addressing a very large problem. And I think what we see today is many of those consortium focusing on key pain points and narrower use cases so that they can actually deliver value. And as they do this, then they need to think of how the network itself is going to become a trusted entity and will basically be operated. And here you see multiple examples and multiple constructions around key players in the industry, either building something that we call a business network operator, which is actually the operating entity of the consortium. We also see some consortium organizing themselves around um, uh, um, their uh, foundation or a more open uh, governance. But business network operator uh, seems to be one of the most uh, developed uh, way of, of organizing your, your consortium today. Now, the second one, as I mentioned, is having a foundation. I think the difference around these two concepts is that a business network operator, and I'm not, I'm not preaching for it, but uh, I see some benefits to it around the operational aspect of the business network operator, which seems to be very useful for the member of the consortium. And I think that's important to take into account because that way you can basically 
um, manage all your operational issue of onboarding your partner and your members and making sure that they run as part of the network and giving them the service that, that the consortium will need to operate in a decentralized way in a much easier fashion than if you are open-minded about it and having a more loose, and I don't mean loose in a negative way, I mean more in a in a in an open uh, source way, so to speak, and having your foundation managing your governance. So we see these two constructions of how those networks grow, and we, you know, I'm I'm not sure today, you know, what what's the best model. I think business network operator seems to be kind of the best way of doing it from my standpoint, but it does not check all the boxes when it comes to some of the challenges and issues. And one of the issue. Um, that we see 100% of the time, and this is also our business, so that's probably why we, we, we kind of, uh, you know, we are exposed to this. One of the issues that we see all the time is basically uh, 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 the infrastructure requirements and uh, compliance and security and regulatory aspects, especially in trade finance, being one of the largest constraints of, of a consortium growing and assembling, assembling and, and growing, right? And the infrastructure is really focused around what is it going to be, what is it going to take for a participant to basically join a consortium and operate as part of the consortium? So you, you have a business network operator, you have some governance, the value it delivers on the use case is good. Now you need to assemble in the case of trade finance. We, we had discussion with some banks uh, in Asia that have tens of thousands of trade partners. And of course, not all of them need to run a node, not all of them need to run, to run their own infrastructure, but many of them actually need to connect and, and operate as one of the participants of the network. And how do you do to onboard them? And basically we see a lot of discussion around what level of security and compliance, how decentralized the infrastructure of the cons consortium should be, or might be, or will be, in what part of the world will nodes be running, who will administrate them, what will be the security around it. And all those questions are basically questions that as you go from one consortium to the other, you always discover new requirements because this is in reality, uh, work in progress. And I think that's what makes it fascinating. So what we do, and that's the only slide where I talk a little bit about Chainstack, but what we do at Chainstack is we basically provide a managed services that, you know, the business network operator or member can basically acquire and use in order to build um, and deploy and, and manage uh, their nodes. Uh, in a way that they don't have to uh, basically uh, take care of it. So we provide full managed services for those nodes. And we also provide an automated onboarding for people joining uh, certain consortium. So that's, that's kind of the solution we build. Now, I wanted to come back on this other view, right? This view is, you know, has a lot of, you know, common names, uh, but they, they're more visible uh, because you, you see uh, the actual uh, name of the project or name of, of the application using it. Again, this is back from 2020. So uh, I think it's not necessarily 100% up to date, but I think it gives you a good view of some of the areas, especially in supply chain management, supply chain finance part of the trade finance, where you see most of the protocol, I'm sorry, where you see most of the projects that have made um, the most effort. And if you look at some of those names in the way as they are trying to uh, go to market, you will notice that many are actually dependent upon having thousands probably tens of thousands of partners coming together so that large banks, large financial institution and, and the like of them for insurance company, like uh, you know, the case of b for instance, would have large networks where optimization and trust could actually be established. And, and I think the infrastructure is really key in this process. Now, of course, you know, the last two issues um, that we see are basically how does that scale, right? I mean, how do you scale your use case with one partner, one too many, and all the participants? And then, of course, how does this scale and what does this scale mean from a scope standpoint and an infrastructure standpoint? And here, you know, what, what we see is basically the best way to, to look at this would be to 
basically create a process where anyone in the trade finance space could basically join any of the consortium and basically become a participant in some very fast uh, option. And this is the level of automation that we are not there. You know, we're not there yet, uh, but this is a level of automation we need to see and we need to build if you want these large trade finance consortium to operate and be truly decentralized, striving and growing exponentially from a number of participants. Then finally, and quite briefly, um, the last point is really the, the governance on how some of these consortium have assembled uh, themselves in trade finance and how uh, they will potentially collaborate together uh, across um, multiple use cases and multiple protocols. And I think those are very basic questions. Uh, I'm sorry, I used uh, an R3 example here for Coda uh, because I thought this uh, graph was uh, quite meaningful. Um, but you know, start from who uh, is allowed to join and, and who can vote and who can decide what and who can enforce changes and then, of course, interoperability. And I think what's, in, what's interesting in this governance is that um, this is something that we see emerging in discussion now for the past uh, probably 12 months. And, and the set of question has changed, right? It's not anymore, let's, let's gather everyone around one ID and, and onboard everyone. No, say let, let's be open-minded and have a start on something that works, uh, especially in the, in the uh, uh, private permission uh, chain. And let's make sure that what we build will be able to scale so that we can accommodate the growth and and the projects that we're trying to uh, that we're trying to develop. So that's what we see um, in this space. I, I think you have uh, all um, you know um, uh, noticed some of those names that I'm sure um, you guys are, are very familiar with. Uh, I wanted to share that with you uh, today. I, I promised my presentation would be about 35 minutes, so I think that's exactly what it was. And I would be happy to answer a question and try to answer a question about the formation of the consortium or maybe on the infrastructure side, what we've seen or what we've done that might be interesting for, for the uh, special interest group. You're on the way it's the supply chain thing. Uh, it comes to the right time. I mean, this, this one in particular because uh, I'm personally engaged in this is in a project that you know is aiming to reapproach all the states, you know, in the greenery. Okay, cross is happening. So same with our climate sick, with there with capital markets, you know, in order to collaborate for delivering global harmonized solutions. Anyway. You pointed out some very interesting uh, topics about trade finance. In traditional trade finance, in this well, you see the nature of trade finance, which you know uh, has been source of, uh, let's say, uh, problem trouble for the whole industry to scale up and to get digitized at least pictures. Uh, so I do share your concern and your, your view into this. Anyway, I will leave the audience, and by the way, I'd love to, to introduce to Julian Gordon, which joined us during this speech. Uh, welcome, Welcome to again to 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 make questions to to Laurent. So I'll Hi, Julian. Hi. Hi, Hi Julian. Hi, how are you? So that was Hi, a great Benjamin. presentation. It's a great presentation. Thank you. I think you're having slight I, I, your your slight bandwidth issues. I think with your Wi-Fi. Indeed. Yeah. So, are there any questions? Hey, uh, really nice presentation. I do have one, uh, if I may. Please, please go ahead, Mitesh. Thank you. 
So I, I'm just wondering that uh, how do we support interoperability between different networks uh, of blockchain? Because uh, I'm just going through the uh, Chainstack website as well as uh, as nicely covered in the presentation today as well that uh, Chainstack support the infrastructure deployment as well as management of different blockchain networks. I'm just curious to know, um, do we have some kind of interoperable solution as well, which uh, ties the not between different networks? And if so, then how does that work? Thank you. Thank you, Nitish. So, uh, no, no, we have not resolved alone uh, the entire problem of interoperability. I think uh, we should consider interoperability to be to be basically conditioned to three things, right? Number one, it's not going to be a full interoperability across all different protocols and you know consensus that you can think of. I think um, most of the uh, 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 challenges we address today are relatively simple, but um, when you think of the construction of them from a compliance and infrastructure standpoint, we allow people to use uh, multiple cloud, multiple nodes, multiple on-prem, uh, multiple uh, hybrid type of deployment to connect together, right? So that, that's kind of an important point because it allows large banks, for instance, um, in the trade finance use case that, that we are dealing with today to basically operate uh, chain stack on premise, um, you know, and and that's how they they want to operate it, and at the same time connect it with and and get members, um, you know, um, uh, using public cloud or using hybrid cloud uh, to basically also connect to the same network, and that creates an an opportunity for uh, scalability, which is the reason why we built uh, this solution. So having multiple networks uh, and also multiple provider of nodes, not only chain stack, but others to basically work together on, on this. And, and I think today the solution is relatively um, uh, good and, and stable. Now we don't know, or I do not know any case um, uh, Nitish of, uh, of anyone that has done work on true interoperability of some of those uh, blockchain consortium, but I can clearly see uh, in the trade finance space uh, some uh, uh, consortium converging, maybe into addressing the same use case on the same protocol and maybe at some point joint forces together. And it's not really happened yet, but I can clearly see that some use case and some commonalities might make sense at some point. <laughs> Sounds good, yeah, thanks. That's great. Any, any other questions? Yeah, I think interoperability is going to be a, a challenging one for the future, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So, Laurent, so maybe I ask a question, right? So, um, uh, I think you're, what you're saying is that, is that governance, and there's a lot more to it than just the tech, right? So, what kind of proportion would you say, or what would be the big uh, experiences you think that people should take? How should they be, if they want to set up a network or connect a network, what, what are the kind of things they should be thinking about? So I think they should be in trade finance. I think they should be focused on one area of the trade finance. I mean, if, if they're focused on documents and document try or good tracking, or if they're focused on, on the on the digital um, um, payment um, uh, aspect of the trade finance. Now, I think those are different industries altogether, and it would be great to solve them as one, which is what many of the consortium are trying to do. But I think we have to start and be humble about uh, the way this can work. And in some way, you have part of this already addressed in supply chain management use cases. And, and I think being narrow in the use case that you address is, is great. Now, the, the second thing is the construction of the consortium. I mean, we've seen early consortium being created four five years ago that, that probably have issues today to grow, not because the idea is a bad idea or the technology is a bad technology, but simply because the way the consortium members can actually join um, might be too restrictive or might appear uh, to be uh, too much one-sided. And the incentive and the benefits or the reward offered for people to join as members is basically not big enough. And part of this, I think, and that's the third point, comes from the idea that you, you know, the, the, the infrastructure management and governance probably need to be uh, something that everyone feels comfortable to. And it was probably underestimated earlier. That includes the infrastructure, right? I mean, if you 
if you run a consortium and you run the infrastructure and the only choice is for members to to basically join your infrastructure and that's you know take it or leave it then you kind of take away some of the benefits of a true decentralized model and also take away the potential of scalability so i think those three components are are important a narrow use case that is a key win and you have a lot of companies i'm sure you know some of them in singapore here um, that that are very narrow objectives and and i think are doing well and and will do very well in the long term and then make sure that you scale or you get ready for scale be open-minded about about the way the consortium can grow and make sure that it can actually be seated in the infrastructure in a way that can be truly decentralized i think ultimately it will have to have certain level of decentralization even in the private permission chain blockchain space and i think that's what's important you said it perfectly, by the way, Laurent. Uh, trade finance is not an industry. It's more than an industry. It's so many industries gathered all together. Each of them, you know, the cross path that has its own specific features. It's payment, it's documents handling, it's, you know, financing, which makes the picture even more complicated. And of course, the governance in this case follows the same pathway, gets more and more complicated and diverse. There's a question from Dan Fahini. Uh, he is asking, who will supervise and orchestrate APIs in an interoperable ecosystem on and off the blockchain? <laughs> so I, I guess nobody knows, right? We have to ask. I, I guess I can, I can tell you um, that that the, the consortium we are involved with, where a financial institution is involved, the financial institution wants to make sure that, that whatever they run, uh, regardless their partner, will, will be com compliant and, and okay from a regulator standpoint. And, and that's probably the first you know, uh, security, reliability uh, issue that people are gonna look at. Then participant could be different, uh, but this is not even interoperability. You know, to start with, it's just like how how this is all going to work, and I think we you cannot go away from compliance and regulation. Maybe I'll ask a quick question. So, so do you see things happening, seeing as you're Asian based, things that are happening in different parts of the world, or do you see it all kind of happening in a similar fashion? Because Laurent, you have, a, you have a, it sounds like a global kind of perspective. Well, so we, we the largest um, uh, consortium we have been exposed to and we are working with today are in, all in Asia. Um, but I think that's also the nature of the fragmentation of the markets here, which creates this opportunity, which is fantastic. So if they if they crack it, I think it it will be the biggest reward. Um, we see a few in Europe, um, uh, probably not as large, or not as um, uh, significant in size, at least uh, from from what we see. Um, we we have less visibility in the US, uh, Julian. Uh, but what what we've been trying to do with most of this consortium is basically provide an automated way to onboard their members. And you know, some of them require this today because they are growing. Some of them are not yet at this stage. And, and for me, you know, bringing Chainstack to a level, or for us, bringing Chainstack to a level where you can basically be part of the business network operator and, and deliver um, an automated onboarding of any new participant to a trade finance use case, whether in documents or in payments or in you know, capital market, and, and provide this in a few clicks, seems to be a, a super nice value proposition. And, and that's where we had the most discussion in Asia. There's another question, Laurent, uh, always from then, uh, still from then. Why does Singapore seem so? far ahead of our jurisdictions in digitizing trade funds. It's a good one, I mean, um, but it's pretty difficult to, to answer. Maybe it's because of geography. I mean, in my vision, the position of the country itself, 
But I'll leave it up to you, Laurent. No, I, I, I mean, this is probably a, a economical and industry-based question. I, I think um, Singapore historically, like Hong Kong, had a lot of regional companies, right? A lot of regional banks. And because you have regional banks, and of course, Singapore and Hong Kong being uh, big, some of the biggest harbor, they have a lot of trade and supply chain. So they naturally, uh, I think, are more inclined to, to favor this. And, and that's why maybe you have more activities here. That, that would be my explanation. Yeah, and I think there's been also been a lot of very good government intervention, right, in, across many countries in Asia Pacific, trying to work out if you're a kind of like hub like Singapore or Hong Kong, you have to perceive the future as well, right? Work, make sure you're competitive. So I don't know if you've seen sure. that. Yeah. True. Sure. Yeah, and uh, I mean, honestly, why why would a government not favor this, right? I mean, exactly. optimizing trade finance seems to be like a super good idea, right? <laughs> I think we'll all agree that. <laughs> Christian is saying small plays and please do listen to what financial institutions ask for to a major extent I'm from Singapore yeah I agree with that it's also the former government that favors this absolutely so any other question please Nobody else. Perfect. So I, I think maybe just one question we can ask Laurent. If everyone wants to get involved in Chainstack, uh, you know, what, what do they, what, how, how will you do that? What, what's, what's the way to get involved or, or, or connect with, with you or your, your organization? Well, thank you, Julian, uh, for this opportunity. So please, I mean, if you guys are building or if you guys are developers, just come to uh, chainstack.com, you, you click on try. Um, there is a free developer plan for a week. You can, you can try uh, Chainstack inside out and there you can actually deploy both public blockchain protocol and private permission blockchain like Hyperledger. And you, know, you can actually deploy your node and, and everything that goes with it for Hyperledger. And then you can start building or you can actually start growing and, and connecting uh, with other members. So that, that's what we do. If you have any uh, question about this, please go to uh, support.chainstack.com or send an email directly at ld.chainstack.com uh, and, uh, and we'll be happy to help you. Today, we have um, a little bit over 8,000 developer uh, at the end of September using uh, Chainstack on, on monthly basis. Um, we have hundreds of customers running in production, both in public and private uh, blockchain. And uh, uh, we have probably you know, uh, six or seven uh, large uh, Hyperledger project, um, either testing, experimenting, or deploying in production in, uh, in Chainstack today uh, across different time zones. Uh, we, we support 13 different regions uh, in Asia, in Europe, and in the US. And you know, please come and, and try us. And we'll be happy to help you if we can, uh, if you want to build uh, your best application with uh, Hyperledger. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Right, Andrea, Julian, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to uh, to share some sort about consortium. If anyone uh, would like uh, to get access to my presentation, I think I shared a copy with Andrea, and uh, and I welcome any question. Thank you very much, guys. Yeah, and this will be on YouTube. Know. And, you know, well, uh, next meeting we're going to hold this in two weeks' time on the nineteenth, on a different time slot. Glad to have you today, Laurent. It was really, really insightful one. Thanks everybody for joining us. Talk soon. Take Thank care, you. everybody. Take care. Take care. Bye, Laurent. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you, guys. Bye -bye.